So my origin in health started with there is an answer and I'm not going to be a victim and no one I love is going to be a victim. And so then I became obsessed. Then I became a biohacker because, you know, I think you know my events are, you know, 12, 15,000 people and I go 12 hours a day. <laughs>
started with, there is an answer and I'm not going to be a victim and no one I love is going to be a victim. And so then I became obsessed. Then I became a biohacker because, you know, I think, you know, my events are, you know, 12, 15,000 people. And I go 12 hours a day for people that wouldn't sit for a three hour movie and got to keep them fully engaged. So, you know, I, I burn 11,300 calories. I got the people that work with Tom Brady, Olympic athletes. They've measured everything in my body over three years. You know, it's like two and a half marathons to give you an idea. I jump a thousand times and every time I come down, it's four times my body weight. So it's, you know, a thousand pounds times a thousand jumps, a million pounds of pressure. So as a result, I learned a lot about how to make my body be a peak performance machine. But then tumor enters my life. I'm 32 years old and I go, I'm a helicopter pilot as well, just for fun. And you got to renew your license every two years. You got to get a, you know, a physical. So I go to this doctor and long story short, um, I keep getting messages. And I tell my assistant, tell them, send them, send the medical. You know, I don't need to talk to him. I get home one night and there's a note stapled to my front door saying, it's an emergency. The doctor says, he must speak to you. Of course, I called, couldn't reach him. It's, you know, 1230 at night. So I have this, you know, I've heard the old philosophy and I really try to practice it that, you know, a courageous man dies once, a coward dies a thousand times. So it's like, let me just deal with it in the morning. I get up in the morning and I'm starting to feel the old feelings again, like those fears. And I thought, you know, I take care of myself, but you know, I do fly all the time, radiation, you know, I have cancer. And the doc says, you have a tumor in your brain. And said, in my brain, he goes at the base of your brain, your pituitary glands. He says, how could you possibly know that? He goes, well, I suspected. So I did another blood test that you have a lot of growth hormone. I said, well, I was 5'1", I'm 6'7". In one year, I moved 10 inches. I got hands bigger than basketball. I wear a size 16 shoe. How'd you figure that out, <laughs> you're genius? I said, what does that got to do with the tumor? And he said, I did these tests. You have, I guarantee you a tumor. We must operate immediately. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because of Jenny, this woman I told you about, you know, I've done all the studies and, you know, now there's more studies. The Mayo Clinic always says, no matter who it is, get a second opinion because they did a study in 2017, 286 patients. The second opinion was the same as the first opinion, only 12% of the time, 88% of the time it was different. And by getting multiple opinions, it refined the diagnosis. So they tell everybody to do it. So I already had that in my nervous system. I said, doc, I said, you know, with all due respect, I'd like to get a second opinion. Who do you recommend? And he had a real interesting bedside manner. I wouldn't be the guy I'd recommend. And he got really angry. And so I figured, okay, he's a surgeon. He wants to cut me. Let me look at the other side. Let me look at the biochemical side. So I went to this man in Boston who was just genius. He's in his seventies, about to retire. Completely different bedside manner, super sweet, loving man. And at the end, he goes, well, you do have the tumor, but you're right. You should never do the surgery. You know, you can die, but most importantly, your endocrine system will never be the same. You'll have no energy. I said, that's not acceptable. And he goes, I think you should go to Switzerland where they have this new, uh, twice a year, every six months you take it, injection, and it'll keep your heart valves from getting too big, which is what happens in gigantism, which is what I have. And I said, doc, I said, but my heart valves are perfect. You told me yourself, there's nothing wrong with me. I just still have this tumor in there. It actually infarct, you know, it swallowed part of itself up, but I still get a lot of growth hormone. I said, what if I just measured it and did nothing unless I saw there was a problem? He goes, well, I'd be more certain. I think you'd be more certain if you did the drug. I said, well, I don't know that I'd be more certain. There could be side effects from the drug. And sure enough, six months later, that drug in America was not allowed because they found it caused cancer. So I missed the bullet. He's a beautiful man, by the way. And in the end, he goes, you know, the baker wants to bake, the surgeon wants to cut, I want to drug you, you should do what you want. So I went to six other docs, I ended up with a doc who finally said to me, Tony, you have huge amount of growth hormone, but he goes, I don't know anybody who can recover from two and a half marathons a day for three days in a row, two days later and be strong. He goes, that growth hormone is causing you to recover. And he goes, I know bodybuilders that spend 1200 bucks a month to try and get what you're getting for free. And so he said, monitor. So I was 32, I'm now 62. And, you know, I've had no side effects for it whatsoever. So that's the background. Then what made me go over the edge for this book at this time specifically was four years ago, I'm chasing a 22 year old professional snowboarder, you know, you know uh, competitive at the Olympics down the mountain. And I don't snowboard that often. And it didn't matter what my age was, I couldn't make those moves. And I had a wreck, I thought I broke my neck and I tore my rotator cuffs severely and I've lived with pain, but it was nine, nine pain. Like I slept an hour one night and, you know, an hour and 15 the next. So I went to doctor after doctor, surgery, surgery, surgery. And then, you know, what's the prognosis? Well, you may not be able to lift your shoulder all the way up, you know, four to six months of rehab. I can't do a seminar with one arm, you know, for four to six months. So 
I said, that I heard about stem cells. I knew about them. We all do. But I've heard a mixture. They're terrible. They don't work. It's all BS. It's fluff. Somebody else saying it's great. So I went to Peter Diamandis, who's a, you know, an MD and a rocket scientist, but an MD from Harvard, and a good friend of mine. And I said, how do I, who's the best expert on this? And he said, go see Dr. Bob Harari. And I know Bob, he's one of the best neurosurgeons in the world. He goes, no, but he was one of the fathers of stem cells. 38 years ago, he gave old rats young blood. And we've all heard about the study. They got younger and the old rats blood went to the younger rats and they got older. That's how stem cells were found. So I went to Bob. And he said, look, you're not gonna get what you need here and you don't wanna use your own stem cells. They drop off the cliff at about 40, 45. He said, you need four day old stem cells. I said, I'm not into fetal tissue. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I'm talking about cord stem cells or placenta. He told me where to go. I did three days of treatment of just an IV once a day and an injection. First day I felt tired. Second day I woke up and, oh, I left out the most important part. One of the docs pulled me aside, showed me my spine and said, life as you know it is over let me show you your spine one good you have spinal stenosis severe one good hit and i've been in pain for 14 years he goes one good hit and you're not gonna be able to walk so i wake up on day two there's no pain in my shoulder no pain in my spine for the first time in 14 years i did an mri three weeks later my shoulder's perfect i'm standing without pain so it made me obsessed. I wanna know everything about stem cells, different types of stem cells, where to go. And then that led to me discovering the things I know you know about too, Sean, which is this revolution that's happening in regenerative medicine and precision medicine. And then I got invited to the Vatican and I was asked to be the cleanup speaker. Believe it or not, the Pope every two years brings the best doctors on earth because he sees regenerative medicine and stem cells as this breakthrough. I attended every class, met the most amazing doctor from all over the earth, I met, you know, 11 year old kid that at four years old was told he had 6% chance of living. He got stem cells from his sister. He's totally alive today. People sent home to die. Then they went and got CAR T cells instead. And they're alive five years later and healthy. And I was like, I got to write a book for all these breakthroughs that are happening. Because what's happening for your audience to know is I'm old enough to remember having a cell phone that cost $4,000, be 10 grand in today's dollars. It was a foot long, it weighed two pounds, it was called a Motorola, you should have used it as a weight. It took six hours to charge so you could get 30 minutes of talk time. And now your iPhone has 100 times the power of what brought us to the moon and back on the lunar landing, and you get it for free. You know, you know, and on your computer, most people know that, you know, microchips are the brain of the computer. The first ones had 4,000 chips, and they were literally a bucket chip. Today, the top ones have six trillion and one microchip and they cost the, an infinitesimal point of a penny so they're 6500 times more powerful and 4.2 million times cheaper that's happening to health because we're all code and you have all these billionaires now that want to live forever and more money and more tech is going in and because of crispr and gene editing now we got diseases that we're ending I, i've interviewed kids that now can see that we're blind I mean, stuff that you would think was going to happen 20 years from now is happening right now. So I want to write a book that would show you what to do to maximize your strength, your energy, your vitality, your power if you're an athlete, but or if you just want to be healthy, here's what to do. Or if you got a major disease, here's not just the standard of care. Here are the heroes that are creating breakthroughs. And almost every one of them, Sean, lost a family member, lost a mother or a brother or a sister to a disease, and it made their brain go, no more. And they'd spent decades to get where we are today, where they found these breakthroughs that literally can save your life. So I wrote the book for people to change their life or to save a life. And I, and I get a call, I'm sure you do too, but at my stage of life, about every 10 days to two weeks, somebody's got cancer, heart disease, somebody in the family's you know, got Alzheimer's, what do you do? So now I have the answers that the very best that I can give them. And then I'm donating the book, all the, all the profits, the same as I did my last three books, Feeding America, we're feeding 20 million people. So while you're changing your own life, reading this book, other people being helped and the balance of the profits go to Alzheimer's research, some of the top people, cancer and heart disease. So we're excited about the impact this book can have. That's the thing, Tony, you know, looking at, you just mentioned it, we have this connective tissue. Usually when you hear these stories of folks who are making big impacts in health, and I just gotta go back to this point. You mentioned that 2017 study, folks going in and getting an initial diagnosis then they get another diet, you know, just go in and get a quote, second opinion. It's only the same about 12% of the time. Number one. Number two, you mentioned in the book that the diagnosis were distinctly different 21% of the time. 
And again, we go in and it's all hands on deck. It's an emergency situation. It's doomsday. The, just a little short stint, because you mentioned dodging a bullet as well with the medication. Yes, yes. At the age of 20, I was diagnosed with a so-called incurable spinal condition as well, where I was wow. never supposed to be able to walk normally again. I'd be in pain for the rest of my life. He wrote me a prescription. It could There was two drugs that were really popular at the time, Celebrex and Vioxx. Yeah, and he, I mean Remember Celebrex, what a disaster that was. He wrote, me a, he wrote me a prescription for Celebrex, which I had side effects from, but Vioxx ended up killing upwards of about 60,000 Americans. You know, so either way, it's just like, and here's the thing too, I asked him at the time, I don't, I had no concept of human health really at the time, but I asked him, does this have anything to do with what I'm eating or how I'm training? He looked me dead in my eyes. He, has, he said, this has nothing to do with what you're eating. But then he wrote me a prescription to eat some pills. You know, and that's the kind of paradigm that we're dealing with. It. And, and here's here's also what I want to encourage folks to do. Please, if you ever get a bad, bad note or bad bit of, bill of goods on a diagnosis, get a second opinion. But not just that from uh, from somebody who's in a different paradigm or a different perspective of the issue and hopefully somebody that has the same goal as you. So if you're getting diagnosed with diabetes and you don't want to have said diabetes, get a second opinion from somebody who believes as you do, that you don't have to have this condition. And so this turns into my next question, which is, so you already had this book in the works for quite some time. It just happened to come out. I worked on it for three years, yeah. During this, probably the health crisis of our time. And we were just talking yeah. before we got started about one of the, the pieces of data that you actually took that I, that I shared, and I'm so grateful for that. Looking at the CDC's report, you know, we had this yes. big database of people 800 US hospitals, over 540,000 COVID-19 patients. Obesity is the number one risk factor for death, which we know 80%. we're not doing about it, but we know it. The second leading risk factor for death was anxiety and fear-related disorders, the second leading risk factor for death from this condition. Right. And so you even address that too, because our mindset, our mind plays such a huge role in our outcomes for our health. Everybody knows about, for, I want to turn two things though, in defense of doctors, I'm not against doctors at all. This book is some of the best on earth. But like you said, in any profession, there's a variety of skills and abilities and perceptions of how to look at things. And doctors are not infallible. But, you know, the half-life of a medical education, today, according to Harvard from a 2017 study, Harvard said it's 16 to 24 months. And they said by 2022, which is now, it would be 73 days. That means half of what they learn is out of date in a minimum within a year and a half. And who teaches them is the pharmaceutical salesman. So you look at like the opioid crisis, these doctors, can you imagine being a doctor? You think you're helping your patient because they're telling you that there's no side effects, they knew better, and all these people are dying from opiates. And it's kind of like, I think doctors, a better way of looking at doctors is they're a good coach, but they're not a commander, right? You need their insight, but you got to still make decisions. When it comes to your health or your, your relationships or your spirituality or how to raise your children, you need people to coach you, but you need to decide what's right because you got to live with it. And these docs, so many of them are such dedicated people. They're devoted. They, you know, they're walking down the street and they're beside a river and they hear somebody drowning. They'll jump in to save them, mouth to mouth save them. But then the minute they save them, they hear two more cries. They save the one, they save the other. Then they hear four more cries. They don't have time to go upstream to see who's throwing them in. And you and I have that privilege. So I want to be fair, but there are docs that this is their specialty. But what you said, you sent to my son. You sent uh, one of your podcasts. And I obviously knew about, uh, you know, 80% related to this, and I've obviously studied psychoneuroimmunology, so I knew what fear does, but to have the CDC, I hadn't seen the study. So I, I thank you for that before we begin the show. I thank you again, because I put it in my book. To show them show that that is the second leading cause of death from COVID was amazing. But let's just talk for a second about the mind. Everybody knows about placebos. Well, they may not know that placebos only came about since World War II that we're aware of consciously. It happened because the, uh, a, a surgeon there was working on guys and if you don't give them morphine, you know, they're going to go into shock and they're going to die, not to mention the pain, right? And they ran out of morphine. So a nurse actually, in a desperation, took a saline solution and said, I got the morphine for you and injected it into these people. And none of them went into shock and most of them got out of pain. So he was so blown away by this when he, after the war, he went back to Harvard and he created the initial studies that now are used when you're doing double blind. You compare it to a placebo. But most people are unaware of the fact that placebos sometimes work better than the drugs themselves because there's no money in telling people that, right? You don't make a lot of billions of dollars of profit in that situation. So what's interesting is 
the greater the intervention, the more convinced the mind is, the greater result in your body. So a small pill versus a big pill, they see a big difference. An injection versus a pill, the injection gets a better result. The VA did a study on arthroscopic knee surgery, and they decided to do fake surgeries on a third of the people. So they cut them open and did nothing, sewed them back up, and the nurses didn't even know the difference between the people. And two years later, the people that had been through the fake surgery, meaning no surgery, whatever, were doing sizably better. So the VA doesn't even cover it anymore. I mean, literally, and then you can give somebody a barbiturate, which they do at Harvard, had done this, say this pill is an amphetamine, it's going to speed you up. So you're not giving a placebo, you're giving a real drug that will make your biochemistry slow down and their body speed up. So placebos should give us some sense of the power of what the mind and the body can do together when they're really managed. And when they're not, when we let our minds run wild and we don't learn to run our minds, the last two chapters of the book are all about this, as you know, then you find yourself in a place where you're at the mercy of whatever comes to your phone or on your television or CNN. And again, these are good people. They're not bad people, but they're doing their job. Their job is to make money for shareholders. That means they need more attention. And we've got to get attention better than anything else, unfortunately, is fear. And so today, the news is not designed to inform you. It's designed to startle you, right? Your child could die from drinking water, film at 11. I mean, it's anything to get you to watch. So they're not bad people. But if you don't take control of your own mind, you can do all these other good things for yourself physiologically. And this can change it all like that. Facts. Facts. So in the book, one of the things that you're really doing is advocating for folks to become the CEO of their own health. You know, and That's looking right. to our wonderful healthcare professionals as support in that and looking at it from the paradigm of coaching versus this kind of parental uh, relationship, you know, and so it's a shift in our in our healthcare system and also understanding something really important. And I've been talking about this. I've been in this field for 20 years and I've been talking about this is very early on is understanding that our education. I graduated from a traditional university. Our education is obsolete so quickly. It's unbelievable. So back at that time so maybe 15 years ago when i really got a hold of epigenetics this is something that's just now being talked about in the highest university settings just now and this science has been around for decades you know one of the kind of founding fathers and the person who really kind of helped get it out in a, in a massive way is dr bruce lipton cell biologist yes and so bruce having, is awesome yeah he's one of my favorite human beings as are you and just having that relationship and learning from him directly and seeing how everything's playing out right now we already know what's coming and so you sharing this insight on stem cells and of course i remember doing a university lecture about 10 years ago and talking about totipotent stem cells and multipotent stem cells and pluripotent stem cells adult stem cells and talking about like guys this is what's coming this is you know and so you making that distinction as well that this isn't you know we've got the umbilical cord placental the placental matrix there's so many different things happening but you really break it down in the book in such a great way and the thing i want to ask you about is specifically in this domain of pain you know a lot of folks today a part of this opioid crisis is people are hurting you know physically right. and mentally and yes. fentanyl recently just this was just a couple of weeks ago this this synthetic opioid is now the number one killer of people between the age of 18 and 45, which is unheard of. And so we've got some real solutions for this. And so you diving in and talking about how can we address pain in a major way and be the CEO of our health? Well, first of all, you, you hit the nail on the head. There's both the emotional and physical, right? So, um, you know, uh, Jack Nicholas did one of the endorsements for the book, and he was there at the Vatican. That's how we met. And we both had stem cell things. He was told that he had to do a spinal fusion which you probably, you know, you, you were going down that direction yourself. And what most people don't realize, it doesn't work 50% of the time, but then you can't function the way you did. And less than 26% of the people can ever make it back to work. And the people who do nothing, about 76% make it back to work. But instead of that, he did stem cells. And he couldn't stand for more than 10 minutes. He was in so much pain. And now he's 82 and he plays golf and tennis again, right? I mean, making changes in days instead of months or years. Cristiano Ronaldo also endorsed my book because he had the same problem. He was trying to do traditional care, taking forever. Pull a hamstring, you know, that's a light one, no big deal. But one like he did, that could be two, three months. He was back on the field full force in two and a half weeks. So these tools are just priceless in that area. But then there's also tools like pulse electronic magnificent frequency. It's a mouthful, P-E-M-F. When I tore my rotator cuffs, 
uh, I met this person who said she's a surgeon, but she said, don't do the surgery. It doesn't work. It was amazing to have that kind of honesty. She ran a whole hospital wing and she said, go get one of these. I think we can reduce the pain enough to create some healing and maybe even get you to sleep. And they came and worked on me. And that's how I got to sleep initially because it took my nine, nine pain down to five. I have one today. I use it every day. It's like a charger, a biocharger for your body. It's pretty amazing. And so there's 3000 plus studies on it to give you an idea. You know, when it comes to pain, you know, I was hit at 65 miles an hour sitting at a stoplight at nighttime. I was like talking to somebody on the phone, waiting for the light to change. And then all of a sudden, I lights coming. I was like, that guy better slow down. <laughs> Boom. And I remember everything in slow motion. They pulled me out of the car. The car saved my life. But I mean, literally everything crunched through. And they want to take me to the hospital. I'll say, no, I'll see my chiropractor. But the next day, I couldn't move. And I, for a year, I went through all kinds of physical therapy. And then I think I was doing better. And I go to run on stage and I hit like second or third step and boom, snap my hips snap under me in pain. Now being a sitting in a chair at 26 years old, like not able to move. And I'm like the one who takes over the room, right? You know, so I met Peter Goscu. And he's got books like on pain free. And I show him in the book also because there, I give you dozens of scientific approaches. But he's a beautiful approach. And he understands he was a Purple Heart vet from Vietnam told he'd never be able to walk again, never be out of pain. He just, like, like you and I, he wouldn't accept that. And he kept looking and studying human physiology. And so he gives you these exercises customized for your body to put your body back in alignment without anybody else doing anything to you. So there's physical things you can do with technology. There's stem cells that you can make this process happen. There's structural things that you can do, but just accepting pain. Like so many people are just living off of painkillers and they think they have no other option. And sometimes, there are some things that could be that far gone, but most of them are not. You just need a different technique. You need something scientifically proven. And the book is, we have an entire chapter just on pain. But I want to I want to touch on one of the things that kind of you alluded to too, which is I'm into performance and maximizing and energy and all those things. I know you are too, but you also, you know, you've got to realize that today there's so many things that can affect your health. And as you get older, the body accumulates breakdown in the DNA, as you know. And so if you really want to make a shift, and I know you're familiar with this, Sean, but maybe your whole audience isn't. I'm not going to try and be technical for them, but most people know at this point, your genome, your DNA is not your destiny. It's a plan. Which you know, of these parts of the DNA, which of these you know, enzymes get turned on or off, which of these genes get turned on or off, is what determines how you're gonna live. And as you get older, the wrong genes get turned on at the wrong timing and vice versa. And so what controls that is your epigenome, as you know, which epi means you know, above. So think of like your genome, the plan is the piano, but the piano player is the epigenome. And that's affected by diet, by exercise, by being overweight, by smoking, by radiation, et cetera. But your epigenome is still driven by sirtuins. Think of it as just seven genes seven master genes that do two radically different things. Number one, they turn on and turn off what's happening in your epigenome, triggering genes. So the right ones are the wrong ones. When, not, when your sirtuins are strong, everything runs great in your plant. They also formulate the impact on your mitochondria. They help you convert food into energy, into ATP, which is the basis of life. If you get cyanide, you die in 30 seconds. Why? because it cuts off the oxygen to the ATP and you can't make any, and literally there's no energy in the body and you die. It's that fast. That's how powerful it is. So sirtuins keep those furnaces blasting, sirtuins turn on and off the genes, and sirtuins, these seven master genes, they also reduce your inflammation, which is the basis of disease. But then they have a separate competing job. Your DNA gets corrupted by environmental factors, radiation, bad diet, chemicals in the environment. And if you're 60 versus 20, you've tripled it, right? You've accumulated that. So those sirtuins go in and clean up the DNA. But at age 50, sirtuins are driven by NAD+, which is something most of your audience probably knows about, has heard about. NAD+, is wonderful. Your sirtuins don't function without it. They're the fuel. But it drops by 50% when you turn about 50 right when you need it most. So imagine you've got this mansion and you have this beautiful staff and they're young and vibrant. Something breaks, they fix it like crazy. Everything always looks perfect, but then they get older and older and older and less energy. And then you have less resources and things don't get fixed. And the whole thing starts breaking down. That's basically aging. So the sirtuins need the NAD to do her job. And for NAD to go into the cell, you need the precursor, 
called NMN, Never Mother Never, right? And most people maybe have heard of it, but if you go on the market, like our firm went out and tested six different products. There was no NMN in any one of the products and they charge between you know 35 and 150 bucks. Most of it comes from China. I don't know if they're lying, but I do know one thing, NMN breaks down within 30 to 40 days. So by the time you get it, there may not be any in it. And so what's the solution? And this is the part that's so exciting. You can give NMN to a, an old mouse. An old mouse, like a 70-year-old mouse, is like 20, 24 months. You give it to an old mouse. Well, first of all, an old mouse can, at best, run a quarter of a kilometer. A strong young mouse can run a full kilometer, full tilt, no problem, but then they max out at a kilometer. You give the old mouse NMN that's actually active in their body for 14 days, and they run two to three kilometers, two to 300% more than the youngest, strongest mouse they're competing with. And they're in their 70s. So you go, well, Tony, does it really transfer? A lot of mice studies don't transfer to humans. So here's what's cool. There's a company called Microbiotech out of Boston. Uh, amazing. If you saw the people on their board, it'd blow your mind. I mean, you know, I interviewed 150 people for this book. 100 of them are, are connected to this company directly. It just blew my mind. After I wrote the book, I found all of them in one place. And they're all working to create a series of products. But the most powerful one is a crystallized form of NMN, so it doesn't break down. It's its own molecule. It's called MIB-626. It's been top secret because they've been using it with the, the military for the last two years, testing it out on special forces. And in Boston, the commander there, even though it's top secret, got so excited about the results, he spilled the beans to the media. And then two weeks ago or a week ago, it was on the Daily Mail as well. And they don't have all the facts because it's still top secret. But I, the part I can tell you that's not top secret is simple. These are the greatest physical specimens in the world, special forces. Their endurance has exploded. I can't tell you the percentage because they haven't published it yet, but I got to see it. Like the mice, but also their muscle development from the same exercise is completely transformed because this NMN is going into the furnace of the energy base of the body. They even have the blood out of the muscles now to see what it does in the muscles, which they never had before. And the cognitive ability goes crazy. And that's what the armies and military are so excited about because when you're exhausted and you're in special forces, your ability to use this matters. So I, I got a chance to visit with this guy. His best friend is 72. He has stopped, you know, he had, he had beginning Alzheimer's. He stopped, he was a world-class chess player, stopped playing when he was 60 because he couldn't do it. He's black playing professional chess at 72 years old because of this. This is not a nutraceutical. This is being taken through the FDA. They believe they'll have this out in 18 to 24 months. It'll be available to anybody. So imagine something that could fire the energy in your body, increase your endurance, increase your muscle strength, and clean up your DNA all at the base of your body. This is just one kind of breakthrough that's coming now. So I tell people what they can do right now and then what they can also do within 12 to 24 to 36 months at the outside so you can take full advantage when it happens. But we're living in a time that blows people's minds. You read in the book, there's a, a group right now, they're, they're in stage three of the FDA. So stage one is safety, you know that, but maybe your audience doesn't. Stage two is efficacy. Stage three is efficacy at scale. And then if you succeed, you get approved. So at the final stage, they believe they'll get approval by the fall or by early next year. Single injection fires off what's called the Wnt pathway. Your own stem cells actually create a new communication. You have osteoarthritis. It regrows all your tendons in about 11 months. And it goes from the clean epigenome, like Dolly the sheep came from an old sheep, but the young sheep's perfect. Well, they have a copy of your original uncorrupted component. So you get like 16 year old tendons and you have no more arthritis. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are coming on top of the things that are here right now. I mean, it's, it, it's, hard, to, it's hard to sleep at night once you read this book, because you see both what you can do right now, what you can do in the near future. And also if you've got challenges, what are the alternatives that really are now proven to make a difference? Like CAR T cells, I don't know if you saw this week, you know, uh, Dr. June, who created CAR T cells, it's an immunotherapy. People have been through all the radiation chemotherapy and they're dying. Uh, immunotherapy has been around, it was around before chemotherapy, but it died. Some people died, they didn't know what to do. And this guy, Dr. June, courageous man, took on these patients that were supposed to die, did this therapy. It's a little drip therapy, immune therapy, no radiation. Nothing. It melted down six pounds of tumors in this man in less than two weeks, completely gone. and. He's done it multiple times, but the article just came out last week or, or two days ago, three days ago, said they're calling it a cure now. 
Because 10 years later, these CAR T cells are still in people's bodies destroying cancer. They never dreamed it would last that long. And they don't use the word cure in the cancer environment. So it's like you, you couldn't be alive at a better time. And we're at the beginning of the beginning. The changes, again, in the next five to 10 years will be more powerful than anything you've seen in 200 years combined. That's what's happening to our lives right now. But if you're in the normal public, you just see standard of care. And especially with COVID, it looks like the whole world's coming apart when actually we're having a renaissance greater than ever. But you got to know. If you don't know, you don't know to go to and you're going to find yourself where ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is disease. Ignorance is pain. Ignorance is low energy. Ignorance can mean death. Absolutely. I've got the book right here. I want everybody to grab a copy ASAP because it's the references in and of itself, Tony has the receipts on everything that he's talking about. It's absolutely amazing. There's one other thing I want to ask you about before I let you go. And, you know, this has been phenomenal because these, these are the things that, especially in this community, we want to talk about how we can be the best we possibly can be. Yes. You know, like what what's the next level of humanity? And so this is very exciting and we have access to so much. And also you're working to make these things more accessible, which is wonderful. Now, at, simultaneously, as you mentioned, there's a paradox taking place. And I believe that this is happening right now. When things are when when things are very consistent and just day to day with business as usual and they're they're solid, it's much more difficult to change them. But when turbulence is happening and things are getting shaken up, it creates an opportunity. It's more malleable to change. And right now, and I and I would love for you to speak to this. We've been chug, chugging along here for decades, allowing our society's health to basically become a dumpster fire, to put it in a scientific term. But, you know, and, and the reality is this, we have multi epidemics of obesity, Alzheimer's, heart disease, cancer, the list goes on and on, just continue to, to increase in recent years. But we can do something about this. It's all been highlighted right now by COVID, but th what I wanna ask you about is the state of our society overall. And my big thing, and what I want you to, to talk about is, let's focus on becoming more resilient. Let's create yes. more robust, healthy human beings instead of buying it. into this inherent weakness that has been programmed essentially in our psyche. I, here's my core belief, and it may sound, you know, like positive thinking. I don't believe in positive thinking. I believe in intelligence. Intelligence is when you study patterns and you see the patterns, you learn from them and you use them. Crisis creates breakthrough. We're at a crisis level. I mean, 75% of America is either overweight or obese. It's we're the fattest country in the world. And it's it's not about how you look, it's about health, it's about vitality. It's why people are breaking down. It's the number one factor other than age, as we just described of dying of COVID. So I think we've hit a crisis, and I think there are people now so tired of the fear that they're starting to break out and they're looking for new solutions on the uh, on the, the scientific front. More money went in during the middle of COVID here for tools to, to anti-aging and to shift what's happening in the body at any time in history. $80 billion, I think, is the number I saw just last year alone. So resources are driving. People are fed up. People are wanting to take control of their life. But it's like anything else. You know, if you saw the, what's it called, the Milgram study, you know, where they, the authority figure told somebody to zap somebody and they kept turning up higher and higher. We've all seen the study. And 67% of the people took it to the point where it could kill somebody because an authority figure told them to do it. But what most people don't notice in that study is when one person objected, it was all acting, nobody knew, right? But when one person objected to the authority, only 10% of the people went to that level. I think what's happening right now is this beautiful dovetail of the crisis is making people reevaluate. It's opening the door for new forms of therapy. There's new economic drives making all that happen. I think all that's happening once, and here's, you, here's history in, in two seconds. Think of it this way. Good times create weak people. Weak people create lousy times. Lousy times create strong people. Strong people create great times. I could take you, I'm a historian and study history intensely, but I'll just give you one lesson and it gives us hope. You know, if you think about the Americans' greatest generation, it's that generation we call the great generation went to World War II. They were born in 1910, for example. So they came of age when we won World War I, and then the Roaring Twenties came on, and we all have a stage of life. When you get 19, 20, 21, that's the beginning of you having your own life, you testing what's true, you going out there. It's freedom, it's the new direction. So these kids grew up in this environment of abundance and new technology and cars, and I'm gonna have a car, I'm gonna have a life, I'm gonna go to parties. And when they turned 19, 1929, 
the world looked like it was ending. People are jumping out of buildings, right? You know, the Dust Bowl in the middle of the US. I mean, everything was horrific, not for a little time, for a long time. Now they make it to 29. What happens in 1939 when they're 29? World War II breaks out. Anybody alive then will tell you, it looked like we're gonna lose. Hitler was blitzkrieging everybody, bombing England. But those same people that were called flappers and weak, kind of like what people talk about snowflakes with the millenniums or, or Z generation arguing with millenniums about now they're old and they're parting their hair in the wrong location. All this stuff is gonna change because when we face enough challenge, we grow. And these millennials who are brilliant, they know how to use technology and these Zs that are growing up with it, the next chapter of our history, they're the ones that are gonna help to face that and help us to conquer that, they're gonna grow. And by the way, they came back heroes. And think about the difference between the late 40s and 50s after World War I up to 60s. Then there's a new generation where it's a summertime and there's internal conflict in the 60s and 70s. And there's the 80s, 90s, 2000s, right? Now we're in winter again. This is winter. It's not over. It's not going to be over when COVID disappears. we got to deal with China. There's going to be real tests to what we think society looks like. But as long as we grow, there's going to be opportunity and we will. So I look at this as like, this is a time of transformation and most people don't transform till they have to. And I think the times are coming where people are noticing they have to, and they're taking back their life. Let's go. Part of that transformation is increasing our life force book by the same name, the living legend, Tony Robbins. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for hanging out. Thank with you, John. Us. Thanks for all you give and all you do, brother. As we covered in this episode, there's a new revolution taking place in pain management. Pain is becoming an epidemic from chronic disease, from trauma, and also from mental and emotional health issues as well. Folks today in our society are experiencing a tremendous amount of pain. And Tony shared a story about being in such pain that he could barely even sleep at night. And this is a level of pain that a lot of folks never experience. But once we get to that place, we'll do anything, just about anything to get out of pain. And being able to have the wherewithal that things can be addressed in an efficacious way, that's what the target really is. And so just to give a little bit more on the benefit of these various types of stem cells. So I've been lecturing on this for quite some time and I did a couple university lectures about 10 years ago around this subject when I saw where science was headed and looking at number one, totipotent stem cells. If you're like, what in the world is that? Totipotent stem cells. Essentially, this is as soon as the egg is fertilized, cells start to divide rapidly. And if these cells are extracted, you could potentially grow a whole person. Like it is that robust in life generating energy. And so that's kind of the strange area that science was in looking at how can we utilize some of these stem cell activities from developing babies, right? Embryonic stem cells. And that was getting into a place where ethics were highly involved and as they should be in the conversation. But now we're pointing towards what about the placenta and the umbilical cord that are largely these throwaway items that for years, if we were looking at even the way that our ancestors were engaging with these aspects of human development, it was more of a ritual involved. It was more of there's some very big value here that today we're just starting to understand because the placenta is essentially the lifeline for that child. And the placenta develops a lot faster than the child does actually. And just being like, what is going on with this placenta being able to do all that it does? And it's just teeming with stem cells. So the stem cells that we're looking at here are also involved inside the blastocysts as well, but in the umbilical cord and also in the placenta, we have pluripotent stem cells, which have the elasticity and the intelligence to essentially become any part of the human body at all. Tissue for the eyes, tissue for the meniscus, tissue for the disc in between the vertebrae of the spine, the list goes on and on. Pluripotent stem cells can become anything that the human body needs. And we have a virtual fountain of youth within our bodies when we're developing to create all this stuff. But this is also being found in these new stem cell treatments. Then we have multipotent stem cells. Generally, multipotent stem cells are residing in a specific tissue of the body. So what that means is multipotent stem cells that are located in muscle tissue are only gonna be doing stuff related to muscle tissue. It might be 
creating new cells related to different types of muscle tissues. Like for example, we have fast twitch, we have intermediate fibers, we have different types of muscle fibers, for example. So maybe it can create a little bit of variation, but still within the same kind of tissue matrix, if that makes sense. And then we have the adult stem cells, which this is, these are types of multipotent stem cells, but these are more specific located in specific localized areas of the body. Now, again, we think of stem cell treatments, usually it's an extraction from one's own bone marrow, for example, then centrifuge and all this process, and it generally is pretty painful and all these things, but there are these new leading edge technologies taking place that are, again, utilizing the intelligence of the human body versus the apparent or supposed intelligent, uh, intelligence of synthetic treatments, right? That are, again, we're treating symptoms through our standard of care, but today we're understanding that a disease manifestation is actually an intelligence of the body to adjust its performance, to adjust the way that it's replicating activity to keep the person alive. So with the example of diabetes, type two diabetes, when the human body starts to manifest insulin resistance, it's doing that to change its operating system to keep the person alive. In excess of all of that insulin being produced in the body, reducing the activity, the receptor site activity, and creating an, an operation system where the person can potentially heal, like just tr creating new conditions where hopefully what is causing the issue is resolved. But a disease manifestation, even if we think about cancer, cancer isn't just this one thing where it's just this foreign intruder. Cancer is something that the human body makes but the human body does a tremendous effort in adapting its performance to actually encase and, and try, to, try to isolate a cancer tumor or finding ways to operate around that tumor. Even if, for example, we have all these stories of damage being done to someone's spinal cord and their body essentially finding a new way where someone would, on paper, believe to be paralyzed, but their brain and their nervous system finds another way to operate, creating new pathways so the person is still able to have function, right? There are many, many documented stories like this, but what makes the difference? And so understanding that disease manifestation is the body giving the symptom that something is off, I'm going to adjust the way that I'm operating to resolve this underlying thing, or what we do in our conventional medicine is we treat the symptom. When the body's expressing this alarm, like, hey, we got a problem over here, we silence the alarm, ignore the alarm until another alarm goes off over here, right? I start to think about the cartoon back in the days, you know, maybe it's Donald Duck and he's like out on his boat, you know, he's doing his thing. He's already, he's pretty pissed off because that's how Donald rolled. And he's get, he gets a hole in his canoe and he's plugging it up one place and then another hole pops up, right? And he's plugging that with his little bill you know, his duck bill, then he's, another hole pops up and he's just trying to plug up all these holes all the while. It's just like, what is putting the holes in the boat in the first place? And you know who it is. It's Ch -ch -ch Chip and Dale, right? It's, it's the little squirrels up to trouble, putting holes in the ship. So instead of eliminating the root cause, I'm not saying you should eliminate Chip and Dale, okay? It's a great series. But what we're doing is trying to plug up the ship when the real issue is <laughs> these squirrels, all right? So we're getting a little squirrely in our healthcare system, and now it's forcing us to really analyze it, like, hey, let's get honest. Is this working? Has what's transpired in recent years, is it working? Well, here's the result. We are now the most chronically diseased society in the history of humanity. Like, as evolved as we're supposed to be as a species, we're the sickest nation in the history of recorded human society ever. Highest rates of obesity, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, liver disease, kidney disease, the list goes on and on. Not to mention our epidemics of mental health issues. And now again, this is not an accident. We're treating the symptoms, everything has become medicalized, even our emotions. 
Even our emotions have become medicalized. The most natural things about us. Human birth has become medicalized, has become an emergency. This is something we've evolved with doing these things and having these things forever as a species. And now there's this farming of situations with natural human function and also farming of sick people. That's where we are. Treating symptoms is not just not getting people better, it's killing people by default because we're not addressing the thing that can actually get people healthier. You know, it's very superficial. Even if our conventional, uh, wonderful healthcare professionals who are going into the field to help and serve people, if they're not educated on what can we actually do to help this person to get better. So, for example, many of my friends and colleagues who are physicians, they're put into a situation where they have to work in volume. They have to have a patient they've got about seven to 10 minutes with them tops in order just to keep the lights on. They've got to have this revolving door. They've got the patient intake. They try to do their best. They try to do their homework, but they get caught up in the day to day. And before you know it, they can't stay up on top of the peer review data. That's just out the window already. They're getting educated by folks, salesmen for pharmaceutical companies who are coming in with a very curated new study that we've talked about this on many episodes of the, of the show. The, the power that pharmaceutical companies have in the multiple scenarios where they've gotten caught basically hiding or manipulating clinical trial data to frame their drug in this positive light. And eventually that drug ends up getting pulled off the market for harming and or killing a lot of citizens like Vioxx is one of the most severe examples where the company Merck got caught manipulating their clinical trial data to create a f favorable outcome in one of the most prestigious peer-reviewed journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, highlighting that this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug is the wave of the future. Number one, it was found to not even be better than over-the-counter ibuprofen. Number two, the risk, because that was the big thing was, well, this is going to help to reduce the incidence of gastrointestinal issue, issues. Didn't even do that. But the thing that was hidden in the trial was the dramatic increase in cardiovascular incidence. They just pushed that data to the side. They published essentially what they wanted, the outcome data that they wanted, because a lot of folks don't realize the peer reviewers and folks who are working at some of our most prestigious peer reviewed journals, they never actually see the real clinical trial data. They see summaries that the pharmaceutical company gives them. It's basically grading their own homework and here you go, I'm turning it in, this is what we got. The same thing happens with the FDA. Again and again and again, we believe, oh, the FDA, are, they must be double checking and running the trial themselves with this drug. No, 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 they don't do that. The pharmaceutical company does their own testing and then they tell the FDA what the results were. That's how it works. And this is why, according to the EJS Center for Ethics at Harvard University, about 200,000 people die every single year from prescription medication. A huge portion of that is from properly prescribed prescription medication. People need to know this. It's not okay. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of our citizens, our family members, our community members every year. And we just think this shit is normal. It's not normal. It's not okay. And this is something we can do something about, but we've got to acknowledge that it's happening. Now, what happens is we get tunnel vision, like we need our drugs. Now, we have to still keep the open possibility that pharmaceutical companies are ap operating in integrity and their multi-billion dollar entities are doing this for the good of humanity we got to keep that possibility open but even saying that you might know you, some a red flag might come up like ah you know that's probably not the case but we got to keep that door open because some medicines obviously can be life-saving and life transforming for folks but more often than not, we've become a culture that is treating the symptoms of disease with things that are largely ineffective and dramatically suppressing our health span, not just our lifespan, but our health span where we're breaking down and decaying so much earlier. It used to be called adult onset diabetes. They had to change the name because kids started getting it. It just got younger and younger and younger where this was relegated to folks, you know, heart disease, for example, 
60s, 70s. That's where you see that phenomenon. Now it's people in their 50s, in their 40s, in their 30s having heart attacks and strokes. Something is severely wrong here. Of course, you know, at the, at the root, it's a misalignment with what our genes expect from us. We talked a little, a little bit about epigenetics with Tony today. And epigenetics is really the leading field of science. It's the umbrella in which all other sciences are under that umbrella. Epigenetics is really the umbrella under which all other sciences are existing. We might not have known that epigenetics was even a thing, which we didn't just a few decades ago. But for decades now, we know this to be the case. So the environmental inputs that determine which and how your genes are getting expressed, right? We all collectively as a society, as a human species, we're sharing collectively about the same 20,000-ish genes that have been discovered through the Human Genome Project and then mapped out later on as time has gone on, gone on. But collectively about 20,000 different genes as a species. Corn has more genetic variety than humans do. All right, I know it sounds corny. I know the joke was a little corny, but it's true, all right? So we were expecting humans to have a million different genes or whatever the case might be. But here's what's really special about us. It's the variation, the potential of epigenetics and how our collective 20-ish thousand genes can be read and expressed so differently. That's what creates such a variety in our species from the way that we look, the way that we think, the way that we move, our functionality, our brain, our cognitive ability, the list goes on and on. There's so much variety as to what we can be and what we can express as humans. And it's because of epigenetics. A set of genes, you know, maybe a couple of genes could have literally thousands of different variations in how they're getting expressed that relate to what we deem to be good health or what we deem to be a disease. Because even that disease, it's not a gene for disease. It's a gene for a different operation. It's a gene for a different activity of the human body. That's where we got to really kind of make a break in the understanding because there aren't genes for disease. That's a misnomer. It's really a different expression or an alteration in what we consider to be normal function. It is normal function under the set of environmental inputs. That's what type two diabetes is. It's creating a normalcy, an adaptation for the human body to survive, carry on our species. It's amazing. Now, we don't wanna live in that per se because we know the outcomes, right? If we are experiencing this insulin resistance, we're probably going to be leaning into more often than not, carrying around excessive weight, which is gonna trigger systemic inflammation and just the dramatic increase in our aging process and the breakdown of our bodies and the list goes on and on and on. So we wanna be in an optimal state, healthy expression of our highest and best genetic expression possible. And that comes from engaging our epigenome. Right? And the power is truly within our hands. We know that there's an entire field of nutrigenomics and nutrigenetics. These are looking at how each and every bite of food that we ever consume is instantaneously influencing thousands of our genes. Instantaneously. That's so powerful. And one of those domains of science is looking at, hey, my genetic makeup actually has a much healthier resonance with these certain types of foods, right? Now we're getting more into, again, personalized nutrition. And even if we're talking about healing, we're looking at precision medicine, not this systemic throwing a bomb into your body, you know, in the form of a, you know, a, a, a full spectrum antibiotic that's just killing off everything. We're looking at what can we specifically target to get this individual healthy, right? This individual who is different from everybody else who've, who's ever existed. Very, very powerful stuff. Now, the last thing to close out this episode is if we never have an interaction with stem cell therapy in our lives, it's okay because at its core, this is a resource that we have within our bodies right now as well that we can use to the fullest potential for us as individuals. Now, having these wonderful therapies is a great, great opportunity, but we have something called stem cell genesis that can take place in the human body where we're producing 
new stem cells from our own internal resources. So we want to stack conditions in our favor. Not saying that these alone can help us to heal from a traumatic brain injury or in Tony's case, a shoulder injury that threatened his life, you know, his, his way of life. So we want to have all of these resources, right, to expand our tool belt, you know, to have like a Batman level utility belt of tools to use versus just a hammer and a wrench, which is kind of what everything is looking like in modern medicine today. If you've got a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail, looks very nailicious. All right. So it's expanding our tool belt, our toolkit and our utility belt. And what does that mean for us to continue to have a virtual fountain of youth within our bodies is to stack conditions in our favor when it comes to our nutrition and eating real food, our movement practices, our sleep wellness, our relationships have such a huge role to play in our overall health and vitality as well. And the things that give us joy and giving ourselves permission in this time when there's so much distraction, there's so many things telling you that you're not enough to allow yourself to engage in things that give you true boundless joy and being able to outpicture that joy to others. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. If it's in your mind, you can change your mind. And if you change your mind, you can change your genetics. It's the complete opposite of genetics. Genetics, victim, epigenetics, you have the option to be a master of your genetics. You're not a victim.